Uh, well, at any rate, um, good evening, everybody, um, and uh, welcome to the webinar. Uh, tonight's subject, as Charlie said, is uh, owner produced parts for certificated aircraft. Actually, we're going to be going well beyond that and, and trying to uh, decipher the, the very complex rules that the FAA has established for what parts are legal to install uh, on certificated aircraft, including owner produced parts. Um, this is a, a complex area, uh, one that I've uh, spent a lot of time studying with um, and had numerous, written numerous articles on the subject, had numerous fights with my uh, principal maintenance inspector at the FISDO who is very upset but so far hasn't, hasn't uh, been able to show uh, that I was wrong about anything. So uh, in any case, um, um, as I said, the rules for, uh, uh, for what parts you're allowed to install on a certificated aircraft are, are rather complex. Um, and the general rule has always been that parts that are for sale for use on a certificated aircraft must be uh, produced pursuant to some sort of an FAA approval, uh, either under a type certificate, a supplemental type certificate, a parts manufacturer approval, or a technical standard order approval. We'll talk a little bit about e each of those terms um, as, as we go. But the FAA has made a special exception to this rule for owner-produced parts that are not for sale, but rather just for use on the owner's own aircraft. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an unusual exception because the FAA has gone to great lengths to make sure that parts installed on a certificated aircraft go through all sorts of approval processes and then they have this carve out that lets owners roll, roll their own parts and it seems a little odd at first. Um, however, uh, that exception really had to be made, otherwise a lot of airplanes um, would never be able to fly again. Uh, I mean, for example, if you have a a, uh, a Funk 24 uh, wooden fabric uh, uh, biplane and you crunch a wing rib, rib on it, you, you can't just pick up the phone, call Funk and order another wing rib. Um, if you couldn't build a new wing rib for that airplane, then the airplane couldn't fly. So there needed to be an exception somewhere uh, for situations like that. And the FAA, in its infinite wisdom, decided to place the, uh, give, give the uh, authority uh, to manufacture parts uh, to the aircraft owner of a certificated aircraft. Um, seems a little bit unusual, but, but, uh, but that's, that's, uh, how it worked. Now, uh, there are some complexities involved in, in owner-produced parts that we will get into as we proceed, but, but basically um, the, the FAA has a special carve-out for owner-produced parts that allows them to be made and installed without going through all of the, uh, all of the, the hassle involved in, in getting FAA approval. Now, uh, ironically, I submitted an article on this to Sport Aviation that published uh, in the current article and by the time and, and I submit these articles a couple of months ahead of time uh, because of the time delays involved in, in publishing a, a paper publication. Uh, by the time the magazine hit the streets my article was already obsolete <laughs> because it turns out that the FAA just changed the rules um, effective uh, the middle of April 2011. Um, and the so they made massive changes to the regulations concerning uh, certification procedures for for parts. Um, the basic rules of the game are mostly the same as they used to be. Uh, however, the regulations were massively rewritten and shuffled around, and so on. So in this webinar, I'm going to be updating you on the very latest and greatest bleeding edge uh, rules uh, that have just, just went into effect uh, in mid-April of this year. Um, and to start with, um, we're going we're gonna to go through some definitions uh, because uh, uh, these regulations are chock full of all sorts of terminology which um, are not uh, 
obvious to the casual observer. So we're going we're to start off talking about what some of these part, what some of these terms mean that the FAA uses in its regulations, and we'll take a look at the regulations and we'll talk about what the actual impact of us are. And let's start out with these three words having to do with with physical or material things, product, article, and appliance. Product is a, an FAA word that is defined to mean an aircraft, an engine, or a propeller. Um, so and, and anything that's an aircraft, engine, or propeller, the FAA refers to in its regulations as a product. They used to refer to it as an aircraft, engine, or propeller, and I guess they decided that in order to get the verbiage down, they would invent a new term. Uh, that w encapsulated all that into one word. So anytime you see product, it means an aircraft engine or propeller. The word article um, is one that they've recently introduced. Uh, they used to use the word part, now they're using the word article. An article is a material, part, component, or appliance. Um, material part or component are sort of self-evident. The word appliance is a term that the FAA uses um, in a kind of an oddball way. It means any instrument, avionics equipment, or accessory installed in or attached to an aircraft that is not part of an airframe engine or propeller. Um, basically, the FAA classifies everything on a certificated airplane into four categories. It's either, it's either um, airframe, engine, propeller, or something else. And if it's something else, it's called an appliance. Um, and uh, it's a little non-obvious sometimes, but for example, a, uh, uh, an alternator or a vacuum pump is an appliance. But a magneto is not an appliance, it's an engine part. Why? Because the engine, because the magneto is is a required part of the engine. It's on the engine's type certificate data sheet. The engine won't run without it. Whereas a, uh, uh, say, an alternator or a vacuum pump is an accessory that that mounts on an engine and takes power from the engine. But the engine doesn't require it. Uh, it is not part of the engine certification basis, and the engine would run just fine if it wasn't installed. So. Um, uh, any rate, appliances are typically uh, engine accessories, avionics boxes, instruments, things like that, and they have to be installed in an aircraft. Um, uh, there's a sort of an unwritten rule about that that Velcro doesn't count. So if you have a uh, a, a, a portable um, uh, GPS. Um, clipped onto your yoke or vel vel velcroed onto your yoke or connected to the airplane by a clamp or something that's no other than a structural fastener, then the FAA says, no, that's not really an appliance, that's baggage, and we're not going to worry about cert certificating it, which is sort of nice. <coughs> um, articles, which, which we said is the new word for part, really, the new FAA word for part, come in in three flavors. Uh, and this is sort of confusing too. The, the FAA uses words, you know, the FAA lawyers use words in very non-intuitive ways. Um, but an article can either be approved or unapproved, or if you prefer to use the word part, that's fine too. It can either be an approved part, or approved article, or an unapproved part or article. An approved part or an approved article has an approved design is produced under an approved production system or quality system and conforms to FAA approved data and we're going to talk a little bit more about what approved data is later but normally um, an approved article is one that is produced under a type certificate, an STC, a parts manufacturer approval or a, or a technical standard order authorization um, and both the design of that part or article and the way it is produced, the, 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 the quality assurance in the, in the production system are all FA approved. So it's a very tightly controlled thing. Um, and it comes with a bunch of paperwork that, that demonstrates that it's an approved article. 
an unapproved article is is one that doesn't meet those criteria. But an unapproved article, uh, contrary to popular belief and and contrary to the belief of my FISTO inspector, who I keep fighting about with about this, just because an article is unapproved doesn't mean that you're not allowed to install it on a certificated aircraft. Um, in fact, there are a class of art of unapproved articles called acceptable articles uh, that are allowed to be installed on a certificated aircraft. An acceptable article is one that has an approved design, but is not produced under an approved production system. And examples of uh, acceptable articles, and this is not an, an exhaustive list, um, but common examples are standard parts, commercial parts, and owner-produced parts. And we'll get into each of those three terms next. But all of those are unapproved but acceptable, which means that we're allowed to install them on our aircraft. Um, so let's talk about those three, those three kinds of acceptable articles. A standard part, uh, think of a nut, a bolt, a rivet, uh, a clevis pin, a cotter pin, uh, that sort of thing. A standard part is a part that's manufactured in compliance with either a U.S. government standard or an industry accepted standard um, that has been published and includes design, manufacturing, and uniform marking requirements. Um, traditionally, a standard part has been one that complies with one of the old World War II uh, specifications. AN uh, stands for Army Navy, MS, which stands for uh, Military Specification, NAS, National Aircraft Specification, AS is Aerospace Specification, SAE is the Society of Automotive Engineers. Any part with an AN, MS, NAS, AS, or SAE part number has traditionally been considered by the FAA to be a standard part and therefore legal to install on a certificated aircraft without any paperwork, uh, without um, uh, requiring a PMA or an STC or something like that. Um, in 1997, the FAA um, published a letter of interpretation that expanded the definition of standard part to include common electronic components. Um, specifically resistors, capacitors, diodes, transistors, and non-programmable integrated circuits. Um, when the FAA did this, they were basically acknowledging that the industry standards in the electronics industry were sufficiently robust that the FAA was, was willing to accept them um, uh, and incorporate them into the definition of standard parts. So prior to 1997, if um, if a uh, 100 kilo ohm quarter watt 5% resistor on the main circuit board of your KT76A transponder um, burned up, uh, the only legal way you could have replaced that resistor was to buy a replacement one from Bendix King at you know 200 bucks or something. Um, but since 1997, that resistor is classified as a standard part which means it's perfectly legal to run down to your local Radio Shack store and buy uh, a resistor with, with the same specs and markings as the one that burned up, soldered into your, uh, into your uh, transponder, and you're good to go. Uh, and so um, a lot of, of, of common electronic components now are treated as standard parts, which means you can buy them from anybody, not necessarily an aviation supplier. They don't need to have any paperwork with them. Um, and and they're just treated like like common hardware uh, like uh, like rivets and and uh, screws and nuts and washers and stuff like that. Um, commercial part is a brand new designation that just became effective in a, uh, April of this year, um, and this is a new concept that that was designed to uh, to solve a, a problem that that existed in this whole parts area. Um, it's very common, particularly on larger aircraft, to want to install um, uh, commercial devices that were not really designed for aviation use. Let's say you have a citation, and in the in the galley of the citation, you would like to put a Krupp's coffee maker. 
Uh, you might want to put an LG flat screen TV in the cabin, things like that. These are, are commercial parts that are, were not designed for aviation use and obviously don't have FAA design approval or FAA manufacturing approval and it's not really practical uh, for that to happen. I mean, Sony is not going to, uh, to develop a whole new line of televisions just for installing in biz jets. Uh, it ain't going to happen. So the FAA came up with this new concept of commercial part. Uh, and it's, it basically allows the manufacturer of an aircraft to create a commercial parts list uh, in the instructions for continued airworthiness for their, their aircraft, get that commercial parts list approved by the FAA, and then any of the items on that commercial parts list like Krupp's coffee makers and, and LG televisions and you know, GE refrigerators and stuff, um, become automatically legal to install in, in, in their aircraft. Um, again, they're not approved parts. Uh, they are acceptable parts. Um, and the manufacturer basically makes up a list, gets the FAA to sign off on that list, and then those commercial parts, those non-aviation parts, are permitted to be installed in the aircraft. Um, and uh, the final um, common acceptable article is, is an owner-produced part. Uh, owner-produced parts are not very commonly used in general aviation. Um, they are very frequently used by the airlines, for example. Airlines are by far the biggest um, producers of, of owner-produced parts, um, and, and they are constantly doing stuff like that. But an owner-produced part is a part produced by the owner of the aircraft for installation on their own aircraft. It, it can't be sold, it can't be installed on somebody else's aircraft, but if the owner produces the part um, and he produces it in a conforming way, which we will get into, then it's perfectly legal for him to install that owner produced part on the aircraft. And once he inst installs it on the aircraft, um, it's a legal part, even if he subsequently sells the aircraft to somebody else, it remains a legal part, um, um, you know, and, and again, the example is the Funk 24 with a crunched wing rib. If, if you build a wing rib for your Funk 24 and then you subsequently sell your Funk 24, that wing rib remains a legal part on the aircraft, even though somebody else now owns it rather than you. Um, now, for many, many years, uh, this owner-produced part carve-out existed in the regulations, but it was never really well defined exactly what an owner-produced part means. In other words, what does an owner have to do to, quote, produce, unquote, a part? Um, and. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, the FAA issued a letter of interpretation defining exactly what an owner-produced part is or, or how an owner can qualify a part as being owner-produced. And that letter of interpretation was very surprising to a lot of people because it was tremendously liberal. Um, uh, up until then, the notion had been, well, an owner-produced part really needs to be manufactured by the owner himself. Uh, and it turns out that's not true at all. What the FAA says in their letter of interpretation on this issue is that an owner is considered to be the producer of a part if the owner participated in controlling the design, manufacture, or quality of the part. Participating in the design of the part may include either supervising the manufacture of the part or providing the manufacturer with the design data, the materials with which to make the part, the fabrication processes, assembly methods, or quality of control procedures. Any of the, doing any of those things qualifies the part as an owner-produced part. So an owner-produced part is not necessarily one that, that you have to make on, you know, on the drill press down in your basement. Uh, an owner can hire anyone he wishes 
to assist him in manufacturing the part. He can hire a machine shop. He can hire an A&P mechanic. Um, uh, he doesn't have to manufacture the part himself. Produce and manufacture do not mean the same thing. He simply has to meaningfully contribute to the production of the part in order to uh, in order for the uh, uh, for the part to qualify as an owner produced part. So essentially, any any part that you want to have built um, can can easily be qualified as an owner produced part under this doctrine. Um, okay, now let's talk a little bit about. Um, about the hard part of owner produced parts which is airworthiness because it's easy to qualify a, an owner produced parts as being owner produced the hard part is qualifying it as being airworthy um, the definition of airworthy a product or article is airworthy only if it meets two criteria first of all it has to conform to its original or properly altered type design uh, properly altered type design means that the original type design was altered by means of a, an STC, a field approval, um, an airworthiness directive, or several other ways of, of uh, properly altering a type design. But it has to conform to either its original type design or a, a properly altered type design via some sort of um, uh, FA approval process like, uh, like an STC or field approval. Uh, and the second thing is it has to be in condition for safe operation. That's the definition of airworthy. It has to conform to its type design. It has to be in condition for safe operation. Note that the term airworthy may only properly be applied to uh, certificated uh, items. An uncertificated item, like an experimental aircraft, doesn't have a type design with which to conform. So you can't really say that an uncertificated aircraft or uncertificated engine or a part for an uncertificated aircraft is airworthy. Uh, that, that the term airworthy has no meaning um, for uncertificated articles. Uh, that's why, for example, um, a, uh, an experimental airplane does not get an annual inspection. It gets a condition inspection. An annual inspection, uh, which is what we do on a certificated aircraft, um, uh, is is meant to determine if the aircraft is airworthy. For an experimental aircraft, you can't determine that an aircraft is airworthy because that term doesn't have any meaning. Uh, all you can do for an experimental aircraft is determine that the aircraft is in condition for safe operation, the second of those two bullets. And that's why we call what we do to an experimental aircraft a condition inspection rather than an annual inspection. In any case, that that's the definition of airworthy. Now let's talk for a minute about major and minor repairs and major and minor alterations. Um, a major repair is defined as being a repair that, if improperly done, might appreciably affect weight and balance limits, structural strength, performance, power plant operation, flight characteristics, or other qualities affecting airworthiness, or that is not done according to accepted practices or cannot be done by elementary operations. A minor repair is any other repair. Uh, the vast majority of repairs are minor repairs. Um, guidance on this can be found in Part 43, um, Appendix A, which has a long laundry list of things that the FAA considers to be major repairs. So for example, um, repair of a wing spar is a major repair. Repair of a wing rib is a minor repair. And, uh, and you can look in, in Part 43, Appendix A, uh, for some examples of where the FAA draws the line. But th this is the definition. Similarly, alterations are classified as major or minor. And the definitions are very similar. Major alteration means an alteration that might appreciably affect all of those things or that is not done in accordance with accepted practices or can't be done by elementary operations. And a minor alteration is any other alteration. Um, so, um, and again, most alterations that we make to an aircraft are minor. Um, the difference between major and minor is that a major repair or major alteration must be done in, 
in conformance with approved data. It must be inspected and signed off by an IA, and it must be documented on an FAA Form 337 that's, that's sent into the FAA. Minor alteration doesn't have to have any of those things done. It's simply um, documented in a simple logbook entry by the installing mechanic, and, and that's it. So a minor repair or minor alteration is one that is of sufficiently small um, consequence that the FAA doesn't want to know about it. <laughs> and a major alteration or major repair is one that's significant enough that the FAA does want to know about it. Okay, let's talk about the word data. Again, it has a very specific meaning within FAA regulations. The word data, as it appears in the FARs, means drawings, specifications, methods, techniques, and practices. Approved data is data approved by somebody who represents the FAA. It, it, it needs a, a signature of an FAA representative. Typically, uh, an aeronautical engineer from, a, from an FAA uh, aircraft certification office or, uh, or um, a manufacturing district office um, a FISDO, Airworthiness Safety Inspector, or a designated engineering representative who is actually not an FAA employee but is, is, uh, is, an, is a designee who is granted uh, magic powers to uh, approve engineering data on behalf of the FAA. Um, so approved data has to be signed off by an FAA employee or an FAA designee. Acceptable data is a much lower standard. Acceptable data is data that complies with all applicable FAA regulations, but doesn't necessarily have to have been signed off by anybody. Um, examples of acceptable data include anything in uh, data that is found in advisory circulars. Uh, FAA has this giant advisory circular called AC 4313-1A which is called uh, Acceptable Methods, Techniques, and Practices. It's, it's uh, about the size of a good-sized phone book, and it's just chock full of all sorts of acceptable data that we can use in, uh, in making repairs and alterations. Uh, instructions for continuing airworthiness, manufacturer's maintenance manuals, overhaul manuals, service bulletins, other accepted industry, uh, aviation industry methods, techniques, and practices all constitute acceptable data. So the rule is if you're making a major repair or a major alteration, it requires approved data. If you're making a minor repair or a minor alteration, and the vast majority of repairs and alterations are minor, then it only ex requires acceptable data and, it, and, and we don't need an FAA signature. So major repair, major alteration requires approved data. Minor repair, minor alteration requires only acceptable data. And the determination of whether a repair or alteration is major or minor is made by the mechanic doing the work. So you're not supposed to call up the FISDO and say, does this need a field approval? It, the mechanic who is doing the work is supposed to be making that decision. Um, and basically, he's making a decision as to whether this repair or alteration is within my pay grade to approve with a logbook entry or above my pay grade and requires the FAA to get involved. That's what that decision is, is and it's uh, made by the mechanic doing the work. So you'll find that different mechanics make judgments in different ways. Uh, one example is um, uh, frequently an aircraft owner will ask to have um, a, uh, a cigarette lighter kind of uh, outlet installed on his instrument panel to plug in uh, uh, portable electronic devices. Um, I've seen some mechanics uh, say that's a major alteration and we can only do it if we get an FAA field approval. Uh, most mechanics whose head are screwed on straight would say, no, that's a minor alteration. I can do it, just make a logbook entry and you're good to go. Um, but each mechanic uh, is entitled to make that determination whether it's above his pay grade or within his pay grade. And if uh, if you go to a mechanic and ask him to do something like put a cigarette lighter socket on your panel and he says, oh, that's a major alteration, we'll have to go talk to the FISDO, uh, I would suggest simply finding another mechanic who has a, a more realistic view of the world. 
<coughs> okay, approvals for uh, products and articles. Uh, there are three different kinds of approvals. Design approval means that a type certificate, an STC, or uh, design approved under a PMA or TSO authorization. Um, so this is an FA approval of the design of a part. Um, a design approval does not allow you to produce a part. It only says that the design is approved. To produce a part, you have to have a production approval. Production approval means that you got a production certificate, a PMA or a TSOA that allows the part to be produced. And a production approval has it mostly is concerned with quality control rather than whether the design of the part is correct. It focuses on having an approved quality control system that ensures to the FAA's satisfaction that every one of these parts you make will meet its design specifications. Um, and finally, an airworthiness approval is a document attached to a part that signifies that that part or or uh, aircraft or whatever conforms to its approved design as in condition for safe operation. Airworthiness approvals are typically yellow tags, which is the kind of the old airworthiness approval tag, or uh, form 8130-3, which is the the white document that are, is more commonly used now. Uh, but it, an airworthiness approval is is a document that comes with a part that that states that it's airworthy. And if a mechanic receives a part that doesn't have an airworthiness approval, then the mechanic has to vouch for the uh, airworthiness of the part that if he installs it. If the part comes with an airworthiness approval, then the mechanic doesn't have to vouch for it because somebody else already vouched for it. We've talked a bunch about PMAs, TSOs, and STCs. Well, let me just kind of define those terms very quickly. PMA is a parts manufacturer approval. Uh, it is normally an FA approval for a third party company to make direct replacement parts for an aircraft's uh, manufacturer's repair parts. So, for example, if I want to put a throttle cable in a Cessna 180, um, I can get that throttle cable from Cessna, and that's automatically approved because it was produced under Cessna's type certificate. Or I can get um, a PMA throttle cable from McFarland, who holds PMAs for all kinds of control cables. Um, and the PMA authorizes McFarland to produce um, replacement throttle cables for Cessnas and a whole lot of other kinds of aircraft uh, that are legal to install. For McFarland to obtain that PMA, they had to convince the FAA of two things. The first thing they had to convince the FAA of is that their throttle cables are, are at least as good as the Cessna throttle cables they're designed to replace. And the second thing that they had to convince the FAA of is that they had a quality control system that assures that every throttle cable they make will, will meet those standards. Um, so the they needed a design, a design approval and a production approval. And both of those approvals are included in their PMA. From the mechanic standpoint or the owner standpoint, a PMA part is equivalent to uh, an OEM, Original Equipment Manufacturer's part. So the McFarland throttle cable is equivalent in every way from a mechanic or owner standpoint to the Cessna throttle cable. It requires only a simple logbook entry to install. It doesn't require any special paperwork at all. Uh, and there's just tons of examples of, of, of PMA parts. Um, Superior and ECI both make PMA replacement cylinders for light combing and continental engines. RAPCO makes PMA approved uh, brake discs and brake linings and de-ice um, parts um, to replace Cleveland uh, uh, brake discs and and linings um, uh, and, and there are numerous other examples of PMA parts but PMA 
is an approval by the FAA for a third-party company to build replacement parts for an aircraft. When I, when I say third-party company, I mean somebody other than the aircraft manufacturer. Uh, technical Standard Order, TSO, is somewhat similar to a PMA, except that uh, TSOs apply to components that don't really care what kind of aircraft they're installed in. Uh, I mean, throttle cables and stuff like that are, are very aircraft specific, and so they're covered by a PMA. TSOs are typically applied to things like altimeters uh, and other kinds of flight instruments, to uh, uh, communications radios, other sorts of avionics, life rafts, ELTs. All of, all of those things are not um, aircraft type specific. An altimeter doesn't really care whether it's installed in a Cessna 421 or a Goodyear blimp. Uh, as long as it knows how to altimate properly, that's all that matters. And so uh, a TSO is very similar to a PMA, except that instead of demonstrating that, that your parts um, are at least as good as some original equipment manufacturer's parts, what you're demonstrating is that your parts meet uh, a, an FAA specification for that kind of part. And the FAA has um, established a long list of TSOs, technical standard orders, covering things like like instruments and radios and, and uh, uh, ELTs and that sort of thing. And so you, if you can demonstrate to the FAA that the parts you make conform with the, with the uh, FAA's requirements, the FAA's TSO, and that you have a quality control system in place to assure that every one you make will conform, then they will grant you a TSO authorization, a TSOA, and you can go into the, into the parts business. Um, finally, a supplementary type certificate. Uh, STCs differ from PMAs and TSOs in that STCs focus on things that are designed to alter an aircraft rather than simply repair an aircraft. Uh, so you apply for an STC um, to get approval for a modification. Um, and uh, STCs are supposed to be granted only for major alterations. There are some glaring counterexamples, for example, uh, Rosen sun visors have an STC. Some FAA guy made a mistake a long time ago because installing a Rosen sun visor requires two screws. And by no stretch of the imagination is that a major alteration of the aircraft. So it really shouldn't have been approved under an STC, but it was. But most, most things that are, that are approved under an STC are a major alteration to an aircraft. Uh, things like horsepower increase, um, a uh, strobe that replaces a rotating beacon, uh, that sort of thing. And um, the STC um, uh, provides approved data for the alteration because it's a major alteration. When you install something pursuant to an STC, you always have to get an IA to sign it off and a Form 337 filed with the FAA because that's the rule for major alterations. Okay, with all of that as background, let's take a look at this brand new hot off the press reg that went into effect April uh, 16, 2011. It's FAR 21.9. It replaces the previous regulation that did this was 21303, which is now addresses something totally different. But the, the current reg that just went into effect 21.9, this is the actual reg, and we'll just go through it real quickly. Um, it's entitled Replacement Modification Articles. It says, if a person knows or should know that a replacement or modification article is reasonably likely to be installed on a type certificated product, that person may not produce the article unless it is, and then there's a list of six things. It has to be one of the following six things. So if, if you're going to be producing parts for installation on a uh, certificated aircraft, it has to meet one of these six things. It either has to be produced under a type certificate or a supplementary type certificate, produced under an FAA production approval, uh, which would typically be granted under, under a, a PMA or a TSO. 
Um, it ha or it has to be a standard part uh, manufactured in compliance with um, government or established industry specifications. We talked about what those were a little earlier. A commercial part, which is this brand new concept of, of installing non-aviation parts in a certificated aircraft if the aircraft manufacturer provides a list of such non-aviation uh, commercial parts in its uh, instructions for continuing airworthiness for the aircraft. Five, uh, produced by an owner or operator for maintaining or, alternate or altering the owner's or operator's product, uh, product meaning aircraft. So that's the owner produced part exception. And finally, fabricated by an appropriately rated certificate holder, typically um, either a repair station or an airline or a Part 135 operator, with a quality system that has been approved by the FAA <coughs> and uh, consumed in the repair or alteration of a product or article in accordance with Part 43. Um, so repair stations, airlines, and Part 135 operators can go to the FAA, get a quality control system approved that allows them to fabricate replacement parts for uh, repair or alteration purposes um, at their at their shop. Um, a uh, a shop that's not an FAA. Uh, uh, Certificated repair station uh, or an individual A and P mechanic obviously cannot uh, will can, will not have a quality system and, and cannot fabricate parts. But um, and be honest with you, uh, this number six thing was will be primarily used uh, by airlines and not uh, not by anybody else. And the last part of twenty one nine says except in provided. Uh, in paragraphs A1 and A2 of the section, which was the type certificate, STC, or production approval, a person who produces a replacement or modification article for sale may not represent that part as suitable for installation on type certificated products. So that's that just has to do with truth in advertising, basically. Give me just a minute here. A little bit of chicken soup here. I'm trying to get my cough under control. Okay, so um, let's, with all that as background, let's focus on the subject of owner produced parts. An aircraft owner operator may produce uh, repair or modification parts for his own aircraft. He doesn't have to have a PMA or any kind of production approval to do that. You would if you, if you were selling the parts or, or even if you were making it for somebody else's aircraft. But if you're making it for your own aircraft, um, there's an exception that to the normal rule that you need a production approval or PMA, and you don't need an approved quality system. So uh, all of those uh, very um, weighty requirements that normally apply to the production of parts for certificated aircraft are waived in the case of parts uh, produced by an owner for his own aircraft. And as we said, the part qualifies as owner produced if the owner or operator does any of these things. Supervises the manufacturer, doesn't have to do the manufacturer himself, um, pro uh, provides design data or provides the part to be duplicated, um, provides materials to manufacture the part from, or provides any of the fabrication processes, assembly methods, or quality control procedures. In other words, if the if the owner has anything to do any anything meaningfully to do with the production of the part, it's qualified as an owner produced part. So this is a total non problem. Um, owner and operator can hire anyone he wishes to assist in the manufacturing of the part, an A and P mechanic, a repair station, a machine shop, any other company or individual, whether FA certificated or not. Anybody you want to hire to to help you manufacture this part is is cricket, and it doesn't make it a non-owner um, produced part. As long as, as you're involved in the production, uh, that's all, all it takes. So what's the catch? Well, the big catch is that like all parts installed on a certificated aircraft, an owner produced part has to be airworthy. 
So it must be in condition for safe operation, which is easy, and it must conform to the aircraft's type design, which is hard. How are you going to get your part that you build to conform to the aircraft's type design? Well, there are really only two ways to do that. One is to get a hold of the type design. In other words, to get the drawings and specifications from the manufacturer. Unfortunately, this is very difficult to do, typically, because uh, manufacturers consider their design drawings um, to be uh, proprietary information. So if I decided, for example, that I wanted to build a, uh, a wing spar for my uh, Cessna 310, if I called up Cessna and said, hey Cessna, would you please send me the, uh, the drawings and specifications for the wing spar on a Cessna 310, they'd laugh at me. They're not going to provide me that information. That's Cessna proprietary information. If I did the same thing for a Funk 24, there isn't anybody to call because Funk is defunct. <laughs> and so uh, uh, chances are that, that uh, those drawings and design specifications very, may very well be lost or down in a basement somewhere where I can't find them. So from a practical standpoint, it is usually quite difficult to obtain the type design information in order to conform to it. Now the FAA understands this, so they offer an alternative approach to conforming to an aircraft type design, and that's called reverse engineering. When uh, Superior and ECI decided they wanted to go into the business of building cylinders for Continental and Lycoming engines, um, I'm sure they didn't pick up the phone and call Continental Lycoming and say, would you please send us your cylinder drawings and specifications because we want to build cylinders for your engines because Continental Lycoming would have laughed at them. What they did is they bought a bunch of Continental Lycoming cylinders, sliced them up into very fine slices, had a very, very expensive machine, um, uh, reverse engineer all of the dimensions and create a set of drawings. They also hired an expensive metallurgist to figure out exactly what metallurgy were in those cylinders and what heat treatment was used and so on. And they took all this reverse engineering data and to the FAA and convinced them that this was um, a viable uh, type design information. Um, and that's usually the only alternative you have. If you crunched a wing rib on your Funk 24, chances are what you're going to have to use, do is take the crunched wing rib and use it as a model to build a new wing rib and to spend whatever time is necessary to determine what the materials were and what the dimensions were and that sort of thing and reverse engineer it. So that's the hard part of of uh, doing an owner-produced part is to substantiate that that part meets the type design. Um, because as I said, normally on a certificated aircraft, we can't get the type design information from the manufacturer. We have to reverse engineer it. Now on a practical, from a practical standpoint, um, there's a very big difference between creating a, uh, an owner produced part for a minor repair or minor alteration and creating one for a major repair or major alteration. Because if we're creating an owner produced part for a minor repair or a minor alteration and the vast majority of repairs and alterations are minor, then there's only two people in the world that have to be happy with that part. Uh, you as the producer of the part and your A&P mechanic who's going to install the part and, and make a logbook entry. And of course, producing the part does you no good unless your mechanic who has to sign off the repair or alteration is, uh, is satisfied that the part is airworthy. Um, but if you enlist your mechanic as a co-conspirator and, and get him involved in the production of the part, then in all likelihood he will be persuaded that it's an airworthy part and won't have any problems signing off the repair or the alteration. On the other hand, <clears throat> if you're trying to do an owner-produced part for
perform a major repair or major alteration, let's say the wing spar that I just talked about for my Cessna 310, that's going to be a big problem because it isn't just enough to for you and your mechanic to be happy with that wing spar. Um, there needs to be an IA who who inspects and signs off the installation and more importantly a form 337 with the IA signature on it has to be submitted to the FAA. Now the IA probably figures that if, if he signs off on a wing spar and submits the 337 to the FAA that somebody in the FAA might get interested in an owner produced wing spar and might have some questions for that IA like for example how did you determine what alloy the wing spar was made out of how did you determine what the heat treatment was and so on and so forth and the IA is is not going to put himself in that position he's not a, a trained metallurgist um, <clears throat> so most IAs in that position would say look I can't I can't sign off this wing spar on this 337 you're gonna have to get a designated engineering representative who specializes in metallurgy um, to certify that your wing spar is conforming and if the DER says it's conforming then I'll be happy to sign your 337 so the bottom line is that if you do an owner produced part for something that the FA considers to be a major repair, major alteration. Uh, it's doable, but most likely you're going to have to hire a DER, which can get kind of expensive. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, if if the owner produced part is a minor alteration, let's say a door handle, um, then that's a real that's a piece of cake because there's there's no FA involvement, there's no IA. There's no Form 337. There's no um, requirement for approved data. Basically, if you're happy with it and your A&P is happy with it, um, that's all it takes. So owner-produced parts for minor repairs and alterations are easy. Owner-produced parts for major repairs and major alterations can be hard. Um, <clears throat> as I said, the best way to um, get your a and P, who's got to sign off this repair or alteration to be happy with the part, is to get him involved in the production of the part. <clears throat> if he's involved in the production of the part, then most likely he'll be satisfied that the part is airworthy. Once you make a repair or alteration with an owner produced part, how do you how do you document it in the logbooks? Well, the proper way, and it's not very often done this way, but this is the correct way is to um, <clears throat> have two separate logbook entries. The first entry is one that you make and sign off as the owner, stating that the part is owner produced, explaining which of the which of the things that you did qualified it as being owner produced, like I supervised the manufacturer or I provided the materials or whatever, and <clears throat> describing how you determined that this owner produced part conformed to the type design. I reverse engineered the old crunch wing rib and uh, and manu had a, a new one manufactured to uh, to duplicate the old one or something. And then you sign that entry off as the producer of the part. Then a second logbook entry is made by your ANP who installs the part, describing the work he performed to install the part and signing it off to approve the aircraft for return to service. So <clears throat> the proper way to, to handle a repair or alteration that is done with an owner produced part is with two logbook entries, one by you as the producer saying what you did and one by the mechanic as the installer saying what he, he did. Now, hey Mike. Yeah. Uh, Mark just had a question on the two entry system that you just referred to. Is that something that you concluded or, or is there actually some guidance that you base those two entries on? Um, that's a good question. The, the, um, there is nothing in the regulations that I know of that addresses this issue. Um, this business about having two logbook entries um, <clears throat> came from 
an article that I could probably dig up if I was pressured to by Bill O'Brien, who was for many, many years the FAA's National Resource Specialist for Maintenance, um, that he wrote on this subject of owner-produced parts in which he described the, the proper way to log them. So I believe it's, it's, um, it's advisory, it's not regulatory. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Anyway, uh, we're we're in the home stretch here. Um, <clears throat> I just want to point out that there are some alternatives to owner-produced parts. An A and P uh, normally cannot produce a new part for your aircraft unless he's, you know, unless it's an airline or a Part 135 operator, or unless he's in a he works for a certificated repair station with some sort of quality control program which typically doesn't exist. So normally A&Ps cannot produce new parts uh, to repair or alter an aircraft. But an A&P almost always is allowed to repair an old part. The, the two exceptions are propellers and instruments which are which A&Ps are not allowed to work on. Um, A&Ps are not allowed to do major repairs to propellers, they're not allowed to do any repairs to instruments. Those have to go to either a propeller repair station or instrument repair station. <clears throat> but with those two exceptions, um, A&Ps are allowed to repair anything on an airplane. So if you have a bad part, a failed part, an inoperative part that needs to be replaced, and if any portion of that defective part can be salvaged, and essentially a new part built around that salvaged part, uh, the part of the old part, then you can call it a repair rather than own a produced part and you don't need to jump through all these hoops <clears throat> and it's a lot easier uh, so for example uh, years ago um, I had to replace a uh, an oil supply line to one of the turbochargers on one of the engines in my airplane it's a, a rigid aluminum line with f flare fittings and b-nuts at each end um, and what we did was we, we went out and got some some raw aluminum tubing and and a flare tool and everything, but we reused the original B nuts. And because we reused the original B nuts, that oil line could be documented as a repair rather than as a new owner produced part. If there was nothing left of the original part that was usable and we had to start absolutely from scratch, then it would have had to been treated as an owner-produced part. <clears throat> There's an old mechanics joke known as the golden rivet. The golden rivet is the rivet that holds the data plate onto an airplane. Um, in theory, if, if an airplane falls out of the sky and winds up in a smoking hole in the ground, and you can salvage the data plate from that aircraft. You can legally build a whole new aircraft around that data plate and call it a repair. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and that's actually happened a couple times. But um, if any part of the original can be retained, then there's no limits to the scope of what can what can be documented as repair. If if a repair is not possible and you are creating a new part absolutely from scratch, then it either <clears throat> will have to be an approved part or it will have to be handled as an order produced part. Here are some of the relevant uh, regs and advisory circulars um, that bear on this on this issue. And as I said, um, 21.9 is brand new, just came into effect in April. Um, also, AC 2145 talks about commercial parts is brand new, also just came into effect in April. And that's it. Um, so I'm going to leave up my uh, <clears throat> email address and website address and so on. And Charlie, if you have any other questions, uh, we, can, we can do those now. We do have some questions, Mike. Uh, we probably have some time for uh, additional questions, too, if anybody wants to get theirs in. But let's start it off with one from uh, Burton. He says, what effect does owner-produced parts have on the sale of the aircraft? A logbook entry is, uh, you know, when, when, it's, when there's a logbook entry indicating that certain parts have been, been owner-produced. Um, 
if it, if the owner produced part, as is typically the case, was used for a minor repair or a minor alteration, it should have no effect whatsoever on the resale value of the aircraft. As I said, if, if you do an owner produced part for a major repair or major alteration, that can get in to be a fairly big deal. But if you do that, then that part probably will have to be signed off by a by a designated engineering representative or an FAA employee, in which case Again, there shouldn't be no no stigma. And as I said, the airlines are, do owner produced parts all the time. Um, so if properly handled, an owner produced part should not have any effect on the resale value of the aircraft. Okay. Um, regarding standard parts, does an SD card or complex flash card for avionics databases qualify as a standard part? Uh, that is, can an owner use a card from Best Buy instead of one from Garmin? Um, it does not, uh, an SD card does not qualify as as a standard part. So whether that, whether a, a Best Buy SD card is officially acceptable um, would really d depend on, on what Garmin has written up um, in its uh, in its instructions for continuing airworthiness, I suppose. Uh, so that that would actually be a, a question for Garmin. From a practical standpoint, uh, I mean, I've never heard of anybody being uh, being questioned about something like that. But um, uh, but it definitely uh, does not fall under the standard part doctrine. A SD card is a is a, a complex electronic component. It's it's programmable, so to speak. Uh, it, it does not fall into any of the FAA's guidance as to what a standard part is, so you couldn't use the standard part exception to cover an SD card. Okay, uh, and Larry has a, a question. Let's see here uh, regarding uh, appliance. You said that it is not if it is not attached by structure, it does not have to be approved. How about using a mount such as a RAM mount or panel dock for a GPS? Does that have to be approved? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, the the RAM mount is very clear. RAM mount uh, typically is, it just uses clamps, um, and uh, the uh, the uh, Air Gizmos uh, docks for the Garmin stuff is actually uh, a little bit more complicated. Um, and I actually wrote a whole article on the subject of of, of that. So if uh, if the questioner wants to drop me an email I'd be happy to send him a copy of the article but the bottom line <laughs> interestingly enough I'll give you the punchline and if you want the details I'll be happy to send you the article the bottom line is that an air gizmos dock mounted on your panel is acceptable for installation um, the problem with mounting a say a 396 or a 496 in on the panel using an Air Gizmos dock has nothing to do with the Air Gizmos dock. The problem has to do with the fact that Garmin's power lead that they provide with the 396 and 496 does not meet FAA specifications. And so technically it's not legal to uh, to tie that power lead into the aircraft's electrical system. And there are some ways around that. Uh, basically the reason it's not it's not legal is because it doesn't meet the FAA's flammability requirements uh, it, and uh, you can actually sheathe it with a fire sleeve and make it legal. Uh, and as, as I said, the, the, the details are in a fairly lengthy article that I, I wrote a while back and I would be glad to uh, email that to, uh, to the questioner if he wants the detail. But the, the Air Gizmos dock itself is, is, is acceptable for installation and it's not a problem. Okay, and Gary uh, wants to thank you for uh, your your webinar tonight. Um, he has an LED bulb. So, is an LED bulb a replacement part as a standard part for a uh, PAR thirty six G landing light in my Cessna? Yeah, the, there are several manufacturers um, that now have PAR thirty six LED lights that are PMA approved um, as direct replacements for the GE. Uh, lamp, and because they're PMA approved, um, no special paperwork is involved to install them. Uh, it's not an STC; it's just a PMA. And uh, 
um, because replacement of landing lights is considered to be a, uh, a preventive maintenance task under uh, Part 43, Appendix A sub C, uh, an owner can actually replace his landing light with one of those PMA approved LED replacements himself and sign off the logbook entry himself and not even have to have an, an AMP involved. Okay, and uh, Brian uh, wants to clarify something on the acceptable data slide. You had an abbreviation ICA. What does that stand for? ICA is Instructions for Continued Airworthiness. And uh, um, since I don't remember what the date was, but sometime in sometime in the in the early 2000s, um, the FAA has required that that any type certificate or supplementary type certificate um, be accompanied with a document called Instructions for Continued Airworthiness, which is a 16-point document that, that provides guidance for, uh, um, for continued inspections and, and that sort of thing. Um, that, that would probably be a whole webinar into itself, but ICA stands for instruction, Instructions for Continued Airworthiness. And um, recently designed aircraft uh, and uh, aircraft engines and propellers and recently designed um, STCs all have instructions for continued airworthiness associated with them. Okay, and uh, Mark would like to know major alteration or minor. Replacing a wheel and strobe in the belly of my aircraft with a new wheel and strobe, slightly larger, which required enlarging the hole. Um, well, I mean, that's sort of an interesting question. Um, Whalen ha provides STCs for its strobes. If you install the strobe pursuant to the STC, in other words, if you rely on the STC data that is provided with the strobe um, as a certification basis for your installation, then um, it's considered to be a major alteration because all STCs are considered to be major alterations and so an IA needs to inspect it and a, four, and a Form 337 needs to be submitted. Um, my contention is that that you can install that strobe and not uh, use the uh, the STC data and treat it as a minor alteration. That's a somewhat controversial um, view uh, and and if we got a whole bunch of IAs and FAA inspectors in a room and I made that proposal we would have a nice hour-long discussion <laughs> but um, <clears throat> if you install the whale and strobe using the STC uh, data that they provided as the certification basis then it is uh, classified as a major alteration requires an IA sign off and a 337 Okay, and uh, could you scroll back to slide 22? Uh, John right. had had missed that one and would like to see that again. And we did, Mike, have a couple of requests tonight to see for people that would actually like to have a copy of the slides. I mean, that's that's entirely up to you. Um, oh, sure, not a, not a problem. Any anybody who would like a copy of these slides, I'll actually send you a PDF file. Um, uh, just drop me an email and. Uh, let me quick go back. This is slide 22 you were asking about? Correct. He missed okay. out on that I'll, part. And then, I'll uh, leave it up there briefly and then go back to the end so where my, where my uh, uh, email address is. So anybody who wants to, um, who, who would like a copy of this presentation, just drop me an email and I'll, I'll send you a PDF of it. Okay, and then... Uh, uh, Bert really appreciates the webinars that, that you're doing to inform, you know, owner operators of how to better uh, maintain their aircraft and use their, utilize their aircraft. Wants to know when you'll do the next one. It the was next not in a, it wasn't a, yeah, it wasn't in our uh, our uh, briefing on what was coming up. I didn't have any future Mike Bush ones listed. Yeah, we need to we we need to do that. Um, uh, hang on for a second. That was kind I of guess, a setup question. <laughs> I, I guess the next one is is going to be Wednesday, September seventh. 
and yeah. you and I you and I need to discuss what the subject is. Uh, we do. Um, for those of you that that haven't picked up on it, we are generally trying to do the first Wednesday of every month. Now this month we're off by a week because we both wanted to recover from Air Venture. Um, and you know, so anytime that there's either a holiday or an, a holiday like Air Venture in the way, then we usually will roll it back a week. But in general, you can plan on the first Wednesday every every month as a Mike Bush webinar. So um, let's take another question here, real quick. Uh, can standard uh, Roger would like to know can standard leather for reupholstery be installed as owner fabricated parts? Does the leather need to be flame tested? Um, the answer is uh, uh, first of all, um, it seemed like compound question. For, first of all, an, an owner can uh, do his own reupholstery under uh, under preventive maintenance um, if the material that he's using is not um, uh, aviation approved stuff then he does need to take a, a swatch of it and submit it to uh, to a lab and and get it flame tested um, in order for the the thing to be legal um, it is uh, upholstery is something that an owner of sophisticated aircraft is allowed to do himself under the preventive maintenance doctrine. Uh, you, you can buy a whole Artex upholstery kit uh, and and put it in yourself, and it's perfectly legal. It does not require an A and P to get involved. But if the material, if if you buy it from Artex, it's all going to be approved materials. If it is not ma approved materials, if you just get it from your local upholstery shop. Then you're going to have to send a swatch in to the to a lab to get it tested. And Roger, it, Roger just wanted to know: uh, isn't all leather just leather and, and not airplane approved? Well, I mean, I'm 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 not an expert on leather, but what I do know is that that um, flammability testing is uh, is required. In other words, any time you install. And I, I think we've sort of gone through this today, but uh, anytime you install a part that is not approved, the burden is on you to demonstrate that it's acceptable. Um, an acceptable part is an unapproved part that you have demonstrated to have met all relevant FAA requirements. In the case of upholstery, the only relevant FAA requirement, since upholstery is not structural or anything, is flammability, so it is the it is the burden of the installer to demonstrate that the that the part meets FAA flammability requirements, unless it is approved material, in in which case um, the approval has already demonstrated that. Okay, and Neil. No, I no, I I will I will agree that with something like leather, the likelihood of it not meeting Flammability requirements is near zero, but but it is the obligation of the installer of an uncertificated part to demonstrate that that it's acceptable and and uh, the way you do that for for leather is to send a swatch in for testing. Okay, uh, Neil's question: Substituting an appropriately rated LED for an incandescent lamp in an interior grime shoulder lamp is this a minor alteration? I I didn't understand the uh, what what part we're talking about. I I think he wants to substitute an LED for an incand incandescent uh, lamp for a shoulder like a uh, an interior shoulder shoulder lamp. What's a shoulder lamp? Well, is I like assume a map light or something. Up, yeah, a map light over your shoulder. I'm assuming okay. is what he's referring to. Well, again, the, the, his question is is not one with a well defined answer. Um, the determination of whether that would be a minor or a major alteration is made by the mechanic who is doing the installation. If I was that mechanic, I would classify it as a minor alteration and have no hesitation whatsoever signing it off. Um, however, uh, I tend to be a little on the liberal side of these things, and uh, there are many mechanics whose but muscles are clenched a lot tighter than mine. Who 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 uh, who want um, 
don't want to go out on a limb on anything. So it's really a question of uh, that 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 the installing mechanic has to uh, has to answer. And again, different mechanics will have different views on what's a major or minor alteration. And so if you go to a mechanic and say, would you install this? And he says, oh, we're going to have to go get a field approval for that. It's going to be a big deal. Um, then go find a different mechanic who has a, a, a less uptight view of the world. OK, and uh, Jonathan would like to know, what would be the most legitimate paperwork process for producing replica appliances, in this case instruments, for aircraft from 1917 to 1930 for himself, but he'd also like to then make them available for purchase uh, to others that want to use them? Oh, boy. Um, that question is... A, very difficult, and B, way above my pay grade. Instruments are normally have to be um, produced pursuant to TSOs. There's very, very strict guidance on instruments. They're taken very seriously. Mechanics are not allowed to do anything to instruments. Uh, FISDO inspectors have specific guidance uh, that anything having to do with instruments are cannot be field approved. Um, so if you use the word instrument it becomes a very 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 big deal and uh, uh, this is something that's that would be way above my pay, pay grade to answer but you you basically need to go to the uh, uh, start with the aircraft certification office and uh, tell them what you want to do and and they will tell you what kind of hoops you have to jump through but I have a feeling that by the time they're done you probably will have lost some enthusiasm for this project <laughs> <laughs> I think your instincts are right. Uh, David has a question. Does buying a part and supervising or performing a modification to it to fit uh, 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 the requirement for owner-produced parts? Sure. I mean, uh, are we talking about something saying uh, the door handle on my Blanca Super Viking broke and I need to produce a, uh, a replacement for it because I can't find one on the market. Um, but that door handle looked suspiciously like a door handle off of a 54 Ford. So I think I'm going to buy a 54 Ford door handle and use it as the as the the uh, starting point for uh, for for creating my owner produced door handle. Yeah, that's perfectly 100% reasonable to do. Okay, and uh, what uh, Barry asked, what would be required for installation of owner-produced baffles that matched OEM outlines but used different materials, 6061 uh, T4 instead of half-hard aluminum? Um, well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, if you look in Part 43, Appendix A, you'll see that the engine cooling system which baffles would be the main part of um, alteration to uh, engine cooling system is considered to be a major alteration unfortunately which means that it would require approved data uh, and a form 337 it um, I, I, I think if you came to me with that as an IA, I would have to say that it would require a field approval. It might be a relatively easy field approval to get, um, but I think because um, the FAA is very clear that, that alterations to an engine cooling system are considered a, a, a major alteration, um, I, I would have to conclude that that would require field approval and that we would have to talk to the FISDO about it. And I hate to say that because I hate to talk to the physio about anything, but this is one that I think you'd have to. Okay. Um, I've got a very involved question. I'm going to give it a shot because Scott was very persistent in his asking of it. So, <clears throat> excuse me, bear with me. Uh, it's a huge issue for several hundred owners of orphan aircraft not currently in production and short on parts. An AD was issued last year on an elevator spar cracking around a hinge. They had to be inspected and, if defective, replaced. It has been six months and the final terminating action has not been issued. 
The reg said the repair required replacement with a serviceable, serviceable spar. None were available. Most of the several hundred afflicted air, uh, aircraft are from the late 70s. One of the most respected wing shops in North America was willing to receive the elevators, fabricate a spar that was an exact duplication of the original, and replace it as part of a total job. At the time in April, that met the reg, and the closest visitor visited the shop and approved. Cost was about 900 per elevator. Shop did her 10 or 12 planes very quickly, was willing to do as many as necessary. Now another shop created uh, and got approval for a PMA from another FISDO. That FISDO is located near the old plant to claim jurisdiction. New owner produced, uh, uh, new, the new producer of the PMA part wor uh, worked with the FISDO to declare that only the PMA part could be used. Price $1,250 just for the SPAR, installation another $2,200. Total cost thirty four hundred instead of nine hundred. Other approved shops can buy the part and install, but the PMA producer is playing. Uh, in, in Scott's opinion, is gouging. The big question: Can the original shop still create spars to plan? The owner can provide this uh, and participate, or does the existence now of this PMA spar prevent that? The new PMA spar manufacturer is uh, is, in Scott's opinion, holding them for ransom. Any thoughts on uh, what what I, I think this might be illustrative for other uh, you know um, people in this situation <laughs> where there is a you know something like an AD and, and there's a, a a big call for a replacement and there's you know it's it's hard to to find that replacement. So what are your thoughts on this, Mike? Well, um, this is something I think that you'd probably want to take up with the Office of General Counsel in D.C., but my initial reaction is that um, it is, it's not within the FAA's uh, authority to declare that, 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 that PMA is the exclusive um, Replacement. I, I I don't think that there's any precedent for for that happening. In fact, um, about ten years ago, eleven years ago, when I was involved uh, very heavily involved with the FAA on the development of an airworthiness directive for twin Cessna exhausts, um, the FAA originally proposed um, to require that exhaust systems on these airplanes be sent for recertification to one of three specific exhaust repair stations and uh, that was found to be illegal and they had to back off that and uh, and the AD ultimately came out that it can be sent to any FA approved exhaust repair station. Um, I, I don't know the full history on, on this obviously but my initial instinctual reaction is that um, there's no way that that a FISDO um, or anybody in the FAA, frankly, can designate one PME, PMA holder as being the exclusive PMA holder for something. Um, uh, that just doesn't sound right to me, and it seems to me that uh, somebody needs to escalate that up to the higher levels in the FAA. This is a repair issue, <coughs> so the key guy um, at the general counsel's office is a fellow by the name, name of Ed Averman, A-V-E-R-M-A-N, who's the, the head lawyer um, having to do with, with repair-oriented uh, regulations. And he's the, I, I would just pick up the phone, call Ed, describe this situation, and see if he can put a stop to it because this just this does not sound right to me. Well Mike another excellent webinar uh, we had about 150 people tonight uh, good turnout and um, I you know I can't thank you enough for doing these here and also sharing the knowledge that you do at AirVenture and through your articles and uh, do you have any closing thoughts for tonight? Just sorry about my raspy voice um, I'm just uh, Trying to recover from a really bad cold that I that I picked up yesterday, and and so I'm glad I was able to get through this in one piece. Yeah, I thought your voice held up just fine, and uh, I appreciate you with you uh, uh, soldiering through it because uh, 
as I said today, I, 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 the show must go on if at all possible in my book. But uh, anyway, Mike, appreciate you doing it tonight. Uh, we'll pick another topic for the next couple of months, uh, maybe in the next couple of days, and get that published for everybody so they can sign up in advance. Again, okay, I'll, any... I'll drop you an email on that uh, in the next couple of days. Sounds great. And, and anyone looking for the recording uh, tomorrow uh, of this tomorrow, again, everything that you need related to webinars is at eaa.org slash webinars. And I want to personally thank any of you that came up to me during your adventure and uh, expressed their uh, pleasure over the webinar series. I had at least a dozen people, and Mike, I hope you had a few people uh, tell you how much that they have enjoyed these because I got a lot of positive feedback, totally unsolicited, uh, people just saying, hey, you're the guy that does that webinars, you know, and uh, just expressing how much they've enjoyed this, this series. So thank you, Mike. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And uh, until next time, have a great uh, evening.